from the NBC newsroom in New York. President Roosevelt said in a statement today that the Japanese have attacked the Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, from the air. I repeat that. President Roosevelt says that the Japanese have attacked Pearl Harbor in Hawaii from the air. This bulletin came to you from the NBC newsroom in New York, which for two years has been at war with Adolf Hitler. To the battlefront of the world, this neighbor at war has sent men, food, airplanes, guns, and ships. December 7, 1942. The National Broadcasting Company today presents a special memorial broadcast of Eyes Aloft. Flesh. One, by motor, low, seen, 15 Lucy 4, overhead, east. Right along, watch the sky. Eyes, watch the planes flying the lanes up below. Eyes along, the 4th Fighter Command of the United States Army Air Forces, in cooperation with West Coast radio stations, presents this special December 7th program, paying tribute to America's war dead, honoring all of America's fighting men, and celebrating the first year of action of the 150,000 volunteer civilians of the Aircraft Warning Service. Fight the law, fight the day, we'll help protect the USA. This is Ken Carpenter speaking, a gala program tonight. William E. Kepner, Commanding General of the 4th Fighter Command, has flown to Hollywood to be with us. Also, you will hear from high-ranking officers of the anti-aircraft artillery at Army Air Corps. We will switch controls to an observation post, to a filter center, and an anti-aircraft target range. Gordon Jenkins and the Hollywood Choir have special musical presentations. And here now is your eyes aloft narrator, Gene Whitman. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Today, December 7th, 1942... America has been at war one year. But not only men in uniform fight this war. There is also a vast army of civilian volunteers who carry on the fight here at home. The Aircraft Warning Service. How many of you can look back and recall how it all started? Well, listen. In the summer of 1941... The 4th Fighter Command of the United States Army Air Forces planned a coast-wide, border-to-border practice maneuver. For the first time in American military history, civilians were to become participants in the war games. Quietly, swiftly, the Army went at the gigantic task of organizing civilian forces. In the Pacific Northwest, Major Richard Calgren assumed the tremendous task of organizing the aircraft warning service. In the southern area, Major John C. Gray tackled the monumental job. In July of 1941, Major Gray went to Sacramento to talk with Dick Graves, then head of the State Defense Council. Well, there, Mr. Graves, I've told you the Army story. <laughs> what a job you have ahead of you, Major Gray. I need help. In particular, I need your help. All right. What can I do? I'd like your office to contact every one of your county defense councils. Okay. And do what, sir? I want the name of some outstanding citizens in each county. You're after leaders. Absolutely. I select one man from each county as the organizer of the Ground Observation Corps. Hmm? And what will that man do? It will be his responsibility to work with the Army. We must select locations for observation posts, pick up area supervisors, and we have to work fast. For five intense months, the 4th Fighter Command worked with local civic leaders. The Ground Observer Corps was rapidly organized. It was a tightly formed system and intersystem of thousands of observation posts, filter centers, information centers. This ground observer corps would, when the time came, alert Army aircraft, searchlight batteries, anti-aircraft artillery, barrage balloon units, would set into immediate motion a vast and intricate maze of military defense. At last, all was ready to test. The system was to be tried December 11th. The war games to be started, but... On December 7th, the tyrant nation started a different sort of war game. A real war game. 
Sunday morning, December 7th, 1941. The Hawaiian Islands. Honolulu. The dastardly bombing of Pearl Harbor by the Japanese. to this eyewitness account of the bombing of Honolulu. Major Ernest Keating, now commanding officer of a fighter group in the state of Washington, was in Hawaii last December 7th. Everything was peaceful and quiet at Wheeler Field at 7.50 on the morning of last December 7th. A few moments later, I heard an airplane in a dive, and it made a noise like a United States Navy dive bomber. At the end of the dive, I heard an, heard an explosion, and at that time, I thought the pilot had failed to pull out of his dive. Before I could reach a window... I heard many explosions in rapid succession. Then I realized somebody was bombing the devil out of the place. But I thought that the Navy had a bombing range nearby and was merely getting in some target practice. However, when I rushed outside, I saw a column of dense black smoke coming from a place on our flying field. I then surmised that one of the planes did fly into the ground and that what I saw was the smoke from his burning plane. At this point, the enemy swooped down and began to strafe Wheeler Field with machine gun and cannon fire. When I heard the machine guns, I at last knew we were being attacked, but wasn't quite sure who was doing it. Just then, I saw several dive bombers north of the hangars and recognized them as Japanese. The enemy machine gunned Wheeler Field for about 25 minutes. This was the longest 25 minutes I have ever spent. It would have been suicide to run out on the field to try to reach any of our planes. Two or three hangars was an, was an inferno of flames. Planes were burning on the field. Ammunition dumps were exploding all about us. Then the Japs left. I ran and helped carry wounded men from a barracks to the hospital. Then the Japs came back. This time I could see them bombing Pearl Harbor several miles away. I saw a great column of smoke rise. It later proved to be from the sinking Arizona. No man or woman who was in Hawaii last December 7th We'll never forget that horrible surprise. At home on that sunny Sunday morning, here in a trusting, believing America, people went about their way as usual. Those who weren't at church perhaps were relaxing in front rooms of homes. Sunday papers scattered about, children reading funnies spread out on the floor, wives in the kitchen contemplating the Sunday dinner menu. Daddy, mm. don't won't let me have the part with the funnies. He's just sitting on it. Matthew, Billy. Come on, give your sister the part with Blondie. Aw, oh, here, sissy. Henry? Yes, dear? What are you doing? I'm reading. Now, you promised to clean the garage today. Oh, well, I, I said some Sunday, not this Sunday, huh? I'm going to see what's on the radio for a minute. Yeah. Now, Henry, if you don't turn off that radio and go clean the garage, I won't cook dinner. Oh, now, Martha. Hey, do you hear that? Mm -hmm. Sky Lombardo, your favorite orchestra. Henry, you're just stalling. Oh, well. We interrupt this program for a news flash from Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. One moment, please. What goes, Dan? Oh, wait, listen. At 7.55 a.m. Hawaiian time this morning, Japanese planes dropped bombs on Pearl Harbor Naval Base. Straight wheel to wheel. What? Many civilians, as well as Army and Navy personnel, are believed dead. Oh, Henry. The amount of destruction is unknown. Lord, Martha. Keep tuned to the station for our latest news developments. Turn it off. Yeah. Never have trusted those dirty Japs. That'll mean war for us, won't it, Henry? Yeah, that'll mean war for us, Martha. Oh! Oh, now, wait a minute. Don't get jittery. Probably just Jack Miller calling to see if I've heard the news yet. Will Daddy have to go to war, Mother? Oh, I don't know. Not, not for a while. Now, don't worry, Betty. Yeah? Yeah, this is Henry Smith. Who? Oh, Yeah. Uh, uh, now? Me? What is it, Henry? Well, I'm glad to. Yeah, I'll put on my coat and be right up. Yeah, uh, goodbye. Well, where are you going, Henry? I don't want Daddy to leave. Now, Martha, now look, kids. Now, this is no time for nerves. That was Phil Lockhart. He's chief observer at our post. But where were you going? He's calling observers to man the post. Say, it's four days ahead of December 11th. Mm -hmm. The aircraft warning service is going right into operation anyway. This won't be play war as you all had planned it. 
No, Martha, no. It's the real McCoy. Yes. We'll be watching for real enemy planes now. I gotta get my leather jacket. You don't know when you'll be back? I don't know. Hey, gosh, Martha, just think. What? The honor I've just had tossed at me. Why? I'll be standing guard on the first doggone watch. Hey, gee, kids, you ought to be proud of your old man now. Up and down the Pacific coast, in every city, town, village, and hamlet, civilian men and women observers and filter center workers were called to duty that Sunday morning. The Army supervised the job. The people of the country, volunteers all, were working in civilian clothes as part of the United States Army. Though they wore no uniforms of khaki, they knew on that ominous Sunday that they, too, were members of America's fighting forces. At this moment, we switch controls to a typical observation post. Located on northern California's Monterey Peninsula, the new little post building sits high on a rocky promontory that juts out into the turbulent waters of the Pacific Ocean, calling Monterey Peninsula. This is Captain E.G. Morrison, South Coast Ground Observer Officer, speaking to you from the sea cliffs in front of the observation post. With me are several oil observers. First, I want you to meet 82-year-old Hale and Hardy Finn Froelich. Finn's coming north by west tonight. And strong. Weren't you an old-time Norwegian sea captain before you retired, Mr. Froelich? That I was, Captain. I passed past the bridge many a night watching the sea. Now I am passing on this cliff watching for the enemy. Well, I know they'll never get by you, Mr. Froelich. Mr. Froelich has been an observer at this post since last December 7th. And here's Mrs. Caris Weston, another of the post observers. Can't we take the microphone inside now, Captain Morrison? I think people would enjoy meeting our chief observer, Whit Wellman, and his wife, Olga. They're on duty tonight, you know. Well, we'll go on in. But first I want to point out about this stone wall around the shack here. Didn't you have something to do with building that wall, Mrs. Weston? Yes, Captain Morrison. Was it your idea? I began it. The other observers helped finish it. Well, this is certainly a splendid post now. The way all you people have worked and built it up from nothing. Let's go on in now. Will you open the door for me, Mr. Froelich? Yes, sir. Warm in here. I think we all spent enough time outside keeping this post going when we didn't have a shack. Oh, Mr. Wellman, you're chief observer at this post. That's right. Of course, my wife here did a, a large amount of the early work in securing observers. That was a long time ago. It was just a year ago today that we first started calling observers to come and stand duty on this coast. There wasn't any building here then, was there? No, from Pearl Harbor to January 3rd, observers just stood up there, exposed to the wind and the rain. Mm, that was pretty disagreeable work. Yes, but we knew it had to be done. On January 3rd, we bought a bag, and we brought it up here. Now, that was a sleeping bag? Yes, it was the one way to keep warm. Well, that is fairly warm anyway. Well, how far were you from the telephone? Oh, we had to run about 200 feet at the phone at the home down below. We couldn't run exactly. We'd stumble along the rocky path that leads down the hill. Then you'd have to climb up all over again and make another flash call. It was really pioneering in those days. Well, this post, like so many others in the Pacific Coast, have come a long way in a year. Well, Charlie Shepard, our county uh, uh, director, uh, explained that if, if we ever if we ever had to have any building or anything else, we would have to arrange for them ourselves, and we did. We raised enough to build this fine little shack. It's well insulated, warm, and it helps us to keep a full quarter of observers at all times. Some one of us in this community will be right here on guard as long as we're needed. And that seems to be the spirit of the Ground Observer Corps workers, to stay in the job as long as they're needed. This is Captain Morrison returning the program to Hollywood. The 4th Fighter Command's Aircraft Warning Service is composed of two major units, the Ground Observer Corps and the filter center workers. Filter centers are located in many of the key cities along the Pacific coast. We now take you to Seattle, Washington, 
where you will hear from Mrs. Negley England, Director of Civilian Components and Signal Officer Colonel Richard Calgren. We've come a long way since our first meeting 16 months ago, haven't we, Mrs. England? Yes, indeed, Colonel Calgren. This anniversary of Pearl Harbor brings back many memories. Yes, but my 16 months with the Aircraft Warning Service seems small when I realize that as far back as 1939, you of the Army were actively engaged in laying the groundwork in this area for the AWF. Yes, we were planning a test maneuver even as far back as 1939. But looking back to the first cornerstone of our present AWS here in Seattle, late in July of 1941, I can remember the afternoon at your home, Ms. England with ten Seattle women to whom you have gave, given the responsibility of each recruiting ten other volunteers. Yes, we were out to form a group of 100 workers for the first filter center training. Then I set out to organize similar groups in other western Washington cities where filter centers were to be established. Just think how long that was before Pearl Harbor. Little did we realize then how those first 100 loyal women would grow to the vast organization we have here now. No one of them at the time guessed they were signing up for a steady job. No. We expected to dismiss our volunteers right after Thanksgiving. Just call them back occasionally for brush-up training so they'd always be ready for any emergency. Remember the morning of December 8th, Colonel Cargan? Will I ever forget it? I mean, the way our volunteers reported for duty. Many without being called. Remember the speed and efficiency with which they took their places in the filter and information center? The great thing about it all, Ms. Zingling, is that the same spirit has carried on these last 12 months without a waiver. And we're all going to carry on for the duration. Well, we of the military can never say enough in praise of our civilian volunteers. You yourself, Ms. Zingling, with nearly 4,000 hours of volunteer service. Well, don't forget, there are many, many others who have served well into the 1 and 2,000 hour brackets. I'm sure we all feel that what we've done has been worth the time spent. Your compensation has come, no doubt, in knowing that you have all done your jobs well. You have the satisfaction of knowing that others may live in safety without fear of enemy attack. It is the fighting spirit, exemplified in our volunteer workers throughout the Pacific Coast, that has carried us all so successfully over this first hard year. The Gordon Jenkins Orchestra and Choir join in a modern song of hope. When the lights go on again...
thank thee, Lord, for daily bread, for homes unbombed above our heads. We thank thee for the right to live and breathe free men. And when, at end of day, we turn unto our beds to rest in quiet peace, we thank thee. to introduce the man whose mission is the protection of the Pacific Coast. He has flown his plane here tonight so that he may speak to us on this memorable date. We present the commander of the 4th Fighter Command, General William E. Kepner. December 7th, 1942. We have been at war one year. The task undertaken by the civilian volunteers of the Aircraft Warning Service last September the 7th seemed a stupendous one. There were no signposts to guide us. We were hitting the Pioneer Trail, and we have come through our first year together. The Aircraft Warning Service is new to modern warfare. In the beginning, we may have lacked training, facilities, and background, but the 150,000 men and women of the AWS did not lack courage, initiative, and resourcefulness. Last December, a few good citizens told us that the volunteer system would fold up by spring. When spring came, some told us that summer vacations would strike a death blow to the volunteer group. In the fall, it was said by some that the volunteers would not go through another winter. But you, the volunteers of the Aircraft Warning Service, have shown how wrong the prognosticators were. Today, the target stands continue to march across the filter boards. To you who are in the audience here tonight, and to those who are listening at their radios, May I express my heartfelt appreciation for the work you have done. And may I thank you for the work I know you will continue to do, so long as your services are needed by the Army. Now may I present one of my staff officers. He is a man many of you know, for he has spent much of his time in the field organizing the Pacific Coast Aircraft Warning Service. Lieutenant Colonel John C. Gray. We have reached a mile post. Today we can look back with satisfaction upon the many problems we have solved together, but we cannot rest upon our oars. I am sure that all volunteers wish to join with those of us in uniform in rededicating ourselves to the task ahead and to pledge again allegiance to our nation and to the Aircraft Warning Service. There are in the studio audience tonight nearly 300 women who have served faithfully and continuously at the big Los Angeles Information Center since last December 7th. They will now rise and repeat after me the pledge. And those of you volunteers listening in at your radios, wherever you may be, we ask that you, too, repeat the pledge with us. Will all volunteers of the Pacific Coast please rise? The 4th Fighter Command Oath of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the United States of America and to the 4th Fighter Command and to the, of the United States Army Air Forces and to the mission with which it is charged and to the mission with which it is charged the protection of the Pacific Coast and of the nation the protection of the Pacific Coast and of the nation from invasion by enemy aircraft from by Another member of my headquarters staff is Colonel Carl Wally, anti-aircraft artillery officer. Colonel Wally. The anti-aircraft artillery is ready and, ready and waiting when and if the enemy ever dares to attack our western shores by air. Anti-aircraft guns can speak with real authority if our crews are warned ahead of time that the enemy is approaching. You, the Volunteer Aircraft Warning Service, must be ever on guard so that you can flash the message to us. You are vital to the protection of the nation. And now, General Kepner, we are ready to transfer our controls to an unidentified practice target range in the Southern California area. We are ready to pay our tribute to those who have died in the fight for freedom. 
It is a time-honored military right to fire a salute to the heroic dead. It is fitting that such tribute be paid to the dead of this war, particularly to those of Pearl Harbor who received a stab in the back last December 7th. But we are a nation engaged in an all-out war effort. Today, every bit of war material must be used to stab back at a treacherous enemy. We cannot justify the waste of a minute of one soldier's time. We cannot spare one ounce of gunpowder, one scrap of brass. Today, our tribute to the war dead must be practical, as I am sure those valiant men would want it to be. When you hear the anti-aircraft guns firing, their purpose will be twofold. First, they speak our nation's solemn tribute to those who have not died in vain. Secondly, they are the snarling voices of guns fired by crews perfecting themselves so that someday they may lay a well-placed blast into an enemy plane. We switch controls now to a firing point on the southern cliffs of the Pacific Ocean. General D.D. Hinman, commanding officer of the anti-aircraft artillery, is there watching tonight's practice. Are you ready down there, Joy Storm? Okay, Ken Carpenter. Here on the cliffs of the Pacific is a mighty battery of high-powered anti-aircraft guns. Above us has been flying an army bomber towing a sleeve, a target at which the gun crew has been firing. Their accuracy is amazing. From the hills around us, giant searchlights stab cold white beams of light up into the air, converge on the target being towed by the plane, follow it through the night. The plane, out over the ocean, will soon be coming back again. And oh, here I see General Hinman, who is here tonight inspecting this gun crew's working, walking across the field. General Hinman, would you come up here and tell us all that is permissible about what's going on? Well, Mr. Storm, this gun crew has been scoring heavily against the target. Well, uh, these are pretty big guns, aren't they, General Hinman? Big and powerful. I wish I could tell you how high up they can fire a projectile, but I can't. Well, I know that you had to clear the ocean more than six miles out before practice could begin. Yes, Mr. Storm, these guns will shoot straight up in the air as far as any anti-aircraft guns built today. If any enemy aircraft gets anywhere within their range, the enemy better start saying his prayers. Well, I'd hate to be an enemy plane trying to get through this gun crew that's firing tonight. Think they're pretty good, do you? Well, I have a new feeling of security for my family, General Hinman. That's one way I can put it. Light finder on target. Director on target. Command, firing. gun crew at practice, a salute to our war dead. Though the lights of the world are dim this December 7th, the torch of freedom shall always burn brightly. This is Gain Whitman on this memorable December 7th, 1942, saying good night to the 150,000 aircraft warning service civilian volunteers who keep constant vigil of our home front so that America will always be safe from any attack by air. Good night. Eyes Aloft is produced for the 4th Fighter Command by Robert L. Redd. Music is under the direction of Gordon Jenkins. This is Ken Carpenter charging you to always remember... Eyes Aloft! Eyes Aloft! Watch in the sky! Watch the plane flying the lane up the floor! Eyes Aloft! Over the sky! Sending a hand, protecting the land we roam! Eyes Aloft comes to you from Hollywood. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Watch the sky! Eyes Aloft! Eyes Aloft!